Oh, that was nice. Thank you. Um, so this might be a mistake, but we'll try anyway. Uh, I, anyone want a pen? Uh, the mistake might be that um, I, I thought it would be really good in the week before, in the time before Easter, to do a series on the week leading up to Easter. You know, the week between when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey uh, and the time he dies on a cross. And uh, and I thought that would be good to do that, and it would be sensible to do it before Easter. So we've got three Sundays. The only problem is, and this is why it might be a mistake, is that. A third of all the Gospels talk about that last week of Jesus' life. Unusual for any biography. Um, if they write a biography of you, I doubt if a third of it will be the last week of your life. Uh, but it is for Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John taken as, as a whole. And uh, so we've got a lot of stuff to get through. Uh, so I thought we'd start with Matthew chapter 21. And in Matthew 21, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, in this beautifully humble and defiant gesture of upside-down kingship. Behold, your king comes to you. A kingdom is arriving. The city is excited. Jesus has come. The Messiah has arrived. Hosanna, save us, save us. The crowds bless him as one coming in the name of the Lord. They want to receive this kingdom. Jesus' mustard seed conspiracy is gaining momentum and uh, is entering a decisive phase as Jesus rides into the city to take the city back. And he goes straight to the temple. And uh, in the temple, he overturns the money changers' tables and the sheep traders' pens. And uh, actually, I don't like this bit. Um, For many years, I didn't like this bit, where Jesus gets angry. And I I thought, because it... It's like Jesus doesn't like business. And, and as an accountant, that's a bit worrying. And, and, it, and actually, when you read the Gospels, Jesus tells a lot of good stories about businesses and business growing and making five talents when you only had two and, making, uh, making, and investing and all of that stuff. There's loads of great biblical bi- business principles and business seems good to me. So... That was one reason I didn't like Another reason I didn't like it was that pretty much every prayer meeting for a season that we had was people would come up to me afterwards or during it and say, God says that he wants to make this a house of prayer for all nations. And I'm thinking, I much prefer worship to prayer. And I don't know when the last time I prayed for Tuvulu was. If you're from Palau, where on earth is that? I, a house of prayer for all nations? Well, I, we ain't going to pray for all the nations. There's 200 of them. That's a long prayer meeting. <laughs> and then, then I realized. I realized that Jesus' problem wasn't with business. Jesus wasn't saying you've got to pray for every country. Jesus was angry with the temple system. You see, people would come to the feast. They were coming to the feast um, at this time. They were coming for Passover. And and all the people had to arrive from all around the empire. They would be traveling hundreds of miles with sheep. And the plan was that by the time this lamb got to the temple, it had to be spotless. And so what they had in the temple were, were sheep police. And the sheep police would inspect the lambs. And if they could find anything wrong with your lamb, they would declare it not spotless, inappropriate, not welcome here. But by the way, we can sell you a spotless authorized lamb for a price. And we don't want any dirty money in this temple. So if you're bringing an offering, if you're buying a spotless lamb, you're Dirty Roman money that you bought from the far-flung parts of the empire, that's, that's got Caesar's head on it. That's not welcome in this holy place. We don't want Caesar's head. Jesus turned that on its head, didn't he, when he spoke to some of the religious leaders and said, show me a coin. And they, they picked one out of their pocket and, and it had Caesar's head on it. Whoops. Anyway, they were not meant to be carrying this stuff because that was, that was dirty money. That was Caesar money. We don't want that in the temple. But we do do a reasonable exchange rate for a price. If you want to use proper money, 
to buy your proper lamb or give your proper offering. That's what made Jesus angry. Jesus wasn't angry about the fact they were trading. Jesus was angry about the way that they were putting up barriers to stop people from every nation coming to the temple to worship God. This was a house of prayer for all nations and everyone's welcomed here. Jesus hates it when there are barriers put up. He hates it when the disciples try to stop the children coming to Jesus for blessing. He hates that barrier. He hates the barrier that stops an unclean so-called woman reaching out and touching the hem of Jesus' garment for healing because she is seen and loved by Father. He hates that barrier. He hates the barrier that says that a leper with his skin disease cannot be touched. And so he reaches out in the name of the Father and touches that leper. Jesus hates all of those barriers. That's what makes him angry. It's not the trade. It's the stopping people, ordinary people, coming to God to pray, to worship, to find him. No barriers. And the fig tree withers. Israel's not as fruitful as it thought it was. And over the next couple of chapters, that tension between the temple authorities and Jesus just grows and grows and grows. It builds. They want to know where he gets his authority in chapter 21. Jesus refuses to tell them, but he aligns himself with John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the outsider, proclaiming the kingdom of God, asking people to repent, to change their lives around. Jesus identifies with him and says, If you say where he got his authority, you'll have got the answer, mate. He says the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of the religious leaders in 21 verse 31. He tells them that they've been very bad tenant farmers. They've not used the entrustment that God had given them for this holy place. That's in, uh, and they were rejecting the son, that's in verse 38. They were refusing to come to the wedding banquet, chapter 22, verse 3. God has got this huge wedding banquet ready for anyone to come, and they were refusing to turn up. Jesus takes no delight in it all. They try and trap Jesus and argue with him about tax systems. They argue with him about marriage in heaven. And he confounds them all, 22, verse 46. And then in chapter 23, he criticizes their unreasonable holiness demands. He criticizes their love of the best seats. He criticizes their love of titles. He criticizes the way that they're stopping people entering the kingdom because this is something for everyone. Everyone's invited to the banquet. You're all included. You're all welcome here. He gets increasingly angry. And in chapter 23, he issues seven woes. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, teachers of the law. Woe to you, scribes. Woe to you, Sadducees. Woe to you, Pharisees. Seven times, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. Because you make it so hard for people. Because you make it so difficult for people. Because you're putting burdens on people that they can't carry. Woe to you. You're a brood of vipers, he calls them. In verse 36 of chapter 22, he says, A huge judgment is coming on this generation because of the trouble that you are causing the people. Jesus takes no delight in it, as I say. He says how much he longed to gather them under his wing like a hen. Mother hen would gather their chicks, but now this house is desolate. What an indictment. An indictment of their whole religious system. And it's in that context that Jesus leaves the temple in chapter 24, verse 1. It says, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Verse 2, do you see all these things, Jesus asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. That's the judgment on the whole religious system, on the whole temple system. 
That was what made Jesus angry. And the disciples were shocked to hear that this temple would be torn down. How could that be? I don't know if you've ever been to Ely. Ely is... Um, It is a village in Cambridgeshire, unless you live there, in which case it's a city in Cambridgeshire, because it has a huge cathedral. To be honest, that's about all it's got. It has this huge cathedral in the middle of this village. Anyone been there? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay, six of us. Good, I can say what I like. um, It's this huge, very imposing, huge, permanent, solid. And and all around it, it's got these tiny little houses and tiny little shops uh, that must have been built hundreds of years after the uh, temple was built. And will disappear hundreds of years before the temple comes down. You get the idea. That was what it was like in Jerusalem. You have this huge temple, permanent, solid, been there for generations, rebuilt hundreds of years ago, extended under uh, just a few decades ago. But now it's built to last, solid. And Jesus says it's coming down. It's coming down. This whole system is coming down. It's a sign of the way that God is moving on from that old religious way of doing things and bringing something new. It's coming down. And we know, we know it came down in AD 70. Just a few years after Jesus spoke this, when the Romans eventually got fed up with the pesky Jews and uh, desecrated the temple, filled the whole area with bones of dead people, uh, causing this desolation in the temple, and just left a wall built into a rock where people could go and wail and cry and post their prayers and express their grief and cry out to God. And some of us have been there and done that. We know that happened in AD 70, The disciples didn't. The disciples were left with lots of questions. So a little while later, they come to Jesus. And in verse uh, 3, well, I'll tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every stone will be thrown down. That's uh, chapter 24, verse 2. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, just outside the temple area, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Isn't that annoying? Isn't that frustrating? See, the disciples ask two questions, don't they? And that's so frustrating. That's so annoying. When will this happen? When will the temple fall? When will it be that one stone isn't left on another? And we know the answer to that. The answer was AD 70. When will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? We don't know what the answer to that one is. The disciples asked two questions. It's much better to ask one question at a time. If... (laughs) if, (laughs) If the disciples had asked one question at a time, life would be a lot simpler for us now. Because Jesus gives a chapter of answer to these two questions, and we're left with the decision as to when he's answering the first question and when he's answering the second question. Now, in fairness, for the disciples, it was one question. Can't imagine life after the temple's been torn down. That must be the end of the age. But Jesus answers question one and question two. Or more controversially, did Jesus think they were the same question? Did Jesus think it was the same event? Let's read it anyway. Let's read what Jesus said. This is a long reading, so I'm going to read it quick. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll just put some highlights on the screen. Uh, there, oh, sorry, there's the two questions. That's AD 70 or the end of the age. And, uh, and anyway, these are some highlights from the chapter uh, that you'll pick up as I read it. Um, what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of the birth pains. Oh, so is that AD 70 or is that the... 
end of the age, the beginning. Well, AD 70 felt like the end for a lot of... Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Well, the gospel didn't reach South America for several centuries. But it did get to Rome in AD 50-something, 60 certainly. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, if only we did, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down and take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be great distress unequal from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again if those days had not been kept short no one would survive AD 73 Masada the mass suicide the Jewish people who'd fled to that outcrop but for the sake of the elect those days will be shortened at that time if anyone says to you look Here is the Christ, or there he is. Do not believe it, for false Christs, false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I've told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you there he is out in the desert, don't go out, or here he is in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For the lightning that comes from the east is visible even to the west. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. The word is parousia, that gets used 24 times in the New Testament. And it seems to mean the end of the age. Seems to mean the return of Jesus in glory. The unveiling, the, the coming, the coming to set up his kingdom. The coming and not to, uh, and coming to settle. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there's a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days. Oh, well, he can't have been talking about AD 70 because immediately after the distress of those days, well, we can hardly say we're living immediately after AD 70, can we? So maybe it's all the end of the age. Or maybe it's AD 70. Or maybe it's the end of the age. Maybe it's, The sun will be darkened. The moon will give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. Heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the... S- The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Wow. Wow. But the word for coming isn't parousia there. It's a different word. He will send the angels with a loud trumpet call. They will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. Soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you'll know that the summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Oh, so we must be talking about AD 70 then. Heaven and earth will pass away. Well, that didn't happen. But my words will never pass away. Amen. Amen. Verse 36, no one knows about that day or hour. So we're talking about those days a minute ago. Now we're talking about that day. Is that, is that different? Was one AD 70 and the other the end times? Are they both talking about the same day? Which days are we talking about? No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you don't know what hour that your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come 
at an hour you do not expect. Some people read the whole of that passage as if it relates to the second question. As if it, as if it relates to the second question, the end of the age. Some people read the whole of that passage as if it relates to the first question that happened at AD 70. Many people think he starts answering the second question when he starts talking about earthquakes and famines in verse 7. Others make the break at verse 14 when the gospel will have gone into all the world and then the end will come. <clears throat> Some say that those days in verse 22 must re refer to the destruction of Jerusalem, whereas the day in verse 36 uh, is Jesus' return. Others see the switch in verse 29 because Jesus uses the word parousia when he comes like lightning uh, and that's across the sky. Words like immediately in verse 34, this generation will not pass away, just confuses the matter. Many of the early church thought that Jesus, well, probably the early church, believed that Jesus would return before the end of the first century. And they were wrong. Maybe Jesus expected to return before, I mean, he didn't know. He said, we just read it, I don't know. I don't know when it will be, Jesus says. Only the Father knows. It's not a sin not to know. I don't know. <laughs> I think you make your choice. Read it, study it, look at it. Make your choice. That's one issue. What's AD 70? What's the end of the age? I do find it interesting that Matthew doesn't make it clearer. I mean, it would be useful, wouldn't it, if Matthew was a bit clearer on this. And it does beg the question, when did Matthew write the gospel? Because if he wrote it when a lot of people say he wrote it much later, you've probably heard this, oh, the gospels were written decades, decades, years, centuries afterwards. He'd have made it a lot clearer if he did write it then. I think this is a really good argument to suggest that Matthew wrote his gospel before AD 70. Because he would have cleared that up for us, wouldn't he? If the temple was destroyed and life was going on, he'd have explained it. And also, this whole thing about one stone won't be left on another, that's a pretty strong statement, and we've just seen a picture of one stone on another. I mean, there's only one wall, but... If Matthew was writing after AD 70, he'd have made sure Jesus... Just a comment. Moving on. The other issue... This is more like a Bible study, isn't it, than a sermon? But anyway, the other issue is that there's two very different situations here. I, I don't know if you noticed that when we were reading it. But up to verse 35, the, the world is in chaos. There's so much trauma, so much trouble, so much difficulty around the place. And, of course, it was for the Jewish believers as they uh, go through AD 70. And it has been for some people in the world every day since. And it is for many people in the world now. And it is for some of us this morning that the world is in chaos, trauma and trouble. Some of us got diagnoses in the last few weeks that have just thrown us into chaos. Some of us had news from neighbours and friends and family that have thrown us into trauma. Some of us uh, know people who've escaped from Ukraine in the last few years. Some of us know folk who are, who are trying to minister into Gaza. Some of us know people who, who've know people who've been in Yemen. Some of us know people who know people who've been in North Korea. It's chaotic, it's traumatic, it's troublesome. And it might have happened in AD 70. It might still to be, to be due to happen, but it's happening now. It's happening now for many people around the world. Even in our own congregation, we've had folk flee for their lives, praying that it won't be in winter. Because spring is so much easier. Praying that it will come at a decent time of life, not when they're pregnant. Praying that it won't happen on a Sabbath. Because on a Sabbath, all the gates of the cities are locked. And I can't get out. 
chaotic, traumatic, troublesome. And the question is, not did it happen in AD 70, is it going to happen later in the time charts and all of that? That's not really the question. The key teaching from this is how do we live? How do we live in chaotic times? How do we live when the bombs go off? How how do we live when we're under threat? How do we live when we're just about to go and see the doctor again? How how do we live when we get that phone call? How how do we live when we hear that news? How do we live when we interact with the BBC or the the news on the screen? How, How do we live? Jesus tells us. How do we live? He says, watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out that no one deceives you. This is a key teaching. Not so interested in the timelines and the charts, but how do we live in these days? Don't be deceived. There's lots of people claiming to be messiahs. I'll tell you five things you mustn't eat, three things you should eat, six things you must do, ten things you mustn't do. All sorts of messiahs, all sorts of Christs. There's only one. Keep your focus on Jesus. Keep your focus on Jesus. Make sure no one deceives you. I'm not going to be over there. I'm not going to be over there. I'm not going to be in there. Keep your eyes on me, Jesus says. Then he says, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. I think when times are tough, we're tempted, aren't we, to disregard the teachings of Jesus. It's easy to see people as the enemy. It's easy to hoard rather than be generous. It's easy to rely on ourselves rather than pray for strength. It's easy to depart from the simplicity of God the Father. It's easy to get caught up with the worry and the fear. And Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. It's, it's easy to become nationalistic and over-patriotic rather than seek first his kingdom. Don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. If there's a petrol shortage tomorrow, don't be alarmed. If inflation goes to 20%, don't be alarmed. If you find you lose your job, don't be alarmed. Stand firm. Verse 13, stand firm. Hold fast, sorry, I should have said, verse 4 is watch out, verse 6 is don't be alarmed, verse 13 is stand firm, hold to the way of Christ. It's hard to be kind when you're being pushed around. It's hard to turn the other cheek when you're being attacked. It's hard to love when you're being hated. Paul talks about standing firm and he says we need the armour of God. We need righteousness. We need faithfulness. We need to know that we are saved. We need truth. We need scripture. We need a readiness to speak about Jesus. We need to know his word. Stand firm. Verse 20, pray. 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 Pray that it will be easy for you. Pray in times of chaos. Pray for spring because being a refugee is hard. Pray that the gates won't be shut. When you need to escape, pray, pray. And tell people about Jesus. Don't stop talking about Jesus just because you're under pressure. Don't stop witnessing for Christ just because times are hard. Don't, Don't stop owning Jesus just because you're going through a time of chaos. Tell people about Jesus because this good news has got to go through all the world. Never more so when people are worried, when people around you are frightened. No, never more so when there is chaos. Tell people about Jesus. And I believe this is the wisest advice just now for us. That we get all sorts of worrying news from every corner of the globe. We hear from Yemen and we hear from from North Korea. We hear from China. We hear from Gaza. We hear from... Ukraine, we hear from all sorts of places. We're always hearing of wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and shortages and shocks. We hear much more than the disciples who lived through AD 70 did because they just saw one army. We see loads because we're better connected nowadays. We hear much more, not just because it happens more, but because we're better informed. Don't be deceived. 
Don't be alarmed. Stand firm. Pray. Talk about Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on him. That's what we do in chaotic times. We live peacefully in chaotic times. We live peacefully in chaotic times. And then there's a switch in verse 36. Because in verse 36 onwards, it's not chaotic. It's not traumatic. There's no trouble. It's all peaceful. There's a security. Verse 36 onwards, as it was in the days of Noah, in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. It was normal. People were having relationships, they were settling down, they were getting married, people were cooking meals, feeding each other, eating, drinking, normal. Life was normal. Jesus talks about this normality. He says, but be careful. Be careful because there's a big surprise coming. Be careful because just like Noah, there's a big shock coming. Like Noah, there's, there's... Judgment coming. Be careful. Jesus talks about the normal things of life carrying on and the danger in normal, normal life is what Seven said last week is to become, to, to forget God, to become complacent, to live without him. Having a theoretical belief that doesn't translate into action. The point is that Jesus is coming back and it'll be a surprise, be a shock. We don't want to get caught in complacency. And in these passages, Jesus warns about two situations. He warns about famine and war and earthquakes that make us fear and worry. And he talks about the normal life, the quiet life, the peaceful life that makes us complacent. And neither of those are appropriate for a child of God. Neither of those things are appropriate for those of us who are trying to be disciples of Jesus. So whatever this passage says about the end times, whatever it says about raptures and all that stuff, which I don't think it does in here actually. I think in the days of now you wanted to be left behind. If you think about that, as it was in the days of Noah, you wanted to be left behind in the days of Noah. Anyway, we'll move on from that. Um, I don't want that to be the only thing you remember about this morning. (laughs) Whatever it says about the end time, whatever it says about a rapture, whatever it says about the display of the glory of the Son of Man appearing from one side of the world to the other, as far as the east is from the west, whatever it says about wars and rumors of wars and destruction and chaos, whatever it says about peaceful life going on as normal and then the end will come, whatever it says about the end times, tells us that in times of fear we're to live Sorry, without fear. Times of chaos, we're to live without alarm. Times of chaos, we're to live prayerfully. We're to live talking about Jesus. And in peaceful times, we're to live passionately. We're to live watchfully. We're to live without complacency as we expect the unexpected return of Jesus. And we get more answers in chapter 25. In chapter 25, Jesus tells three parables. And I haven't got time to to look at them in detail at all. But I just want to take two minutes to talk about these three parables. The first one is is the parable of the ten virgins, the ten bridesmaids. Five of them run out of oil. Five of them don't. Don't run out of oil, Jesus says. The oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. 
And if you're talking about living in normal times, if you're talking about waiting for the unexpected visit of the bridegroom, then the last thing you want to do is run out of oil. You need to keep on being filled up. You need to, if you're going to live without complacency, you need to keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're going to live without complacency in normal times, waiting for the bridegroom, then you need to keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Get more oil. Keep burning brightly. Keep on being filled. Keep a light. Don't run out of oil. I'm sure loads of you know loads of people who've run out of oil. Don't run out of oil. Don't get complacent. Keep getting topped up. Keep coming back to the source. Keep buying more oil. The second parable is Jesus' favorite parable of the talents. I say it's his favorite one because we get it recorded so many times in so many different ways. It's a business parable and uh, basically says... Use what you've got to invest in the kingdom. Use the gifts that God has given you to multiply something for the king. Take what God has given you and use it. Use it well. And as you do that, you will be rewarded. In normal times, take your one talent, your five talents, your two talents, your one mina, whatever it is, depending on which version of the parable you're reading. Take it and invest it, use it, multiply it for the kingdom. Because that will stop you getting complacent. If you're living for Jesus, doing the stuff, investing your talents, using your gifts, making a difference, taking all your abilities, serving Jesus. The third parable is the parable of the sheep and the goats, where the sheep are separated from the goats on the basis of how they treated the poor, how they treated the homeless, how they treated the prisoners, how they treated the hungry. And Jesus says, as you did it to those, you did it to me. To avoid complacency in normal times, we need to be filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit. We need to keep using our gifts and we need to be serving the poor. We need to be lifting up those around us, helping those in need. We're meant to be those people who have a kind word, a good action. We're meant to be those who are generous. We're meant to not be those who hoard, but those who give. We live passionately in peaceful times. Determinedly filled with the Holy Spirit purposefully using our gifts, compassionately caring for the poor. We live peacefully through chaotic times and we live passionately through peaceful times. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. But we give ourselves to the filling of the Holy Spirit, to using the gifts God has given us, to working well with the poor, We live without fear. We live without alarm. We live prayerfully. We live without complacency. As we live in peace. We live peacefully through the chaotic times. Passionately through the peaceful times. As we get through all our AD 70s. And as we expect the unexpected return of our Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Can we stand? As we take communion in a minute, I just want to encourage you to put yourself in one of those two camps. Whether you feel at the moment that you're living in a chaotic time, and it might change next week, but this week now. If you're living in a chaotic time, then... Determine not to be alarmed. Determine to pray. Determine to talk about Jesus. Determine to live peacefully. And if you're living in peaceful times, then determine to push in for more of the oil of the Holy Spirit. Determine to use the gifts that God has given you well for his kingdom. Determine to be one who looks to lift up the poor. So Jesus, as we stand before you, I pray, Lord God, that you would give us 
Those of us who need your peace and comfort and help, I pray that you would pour that in without limit now so that people would be able to stand firm so that through the trauma and the difficulty and the hardship, they would know that there's a God who they're calling on, trusting in. And as they prayerfully and boldly and peaceably live for you, I pray, Lord God, that they would have a serenity and a beauty and a grace through this trial and trauma and difficulty that astounds them and astounds the people around them. And for the rest of us, Lord God, who are living through normal times, I pray that you would put in us a hunger, a thirst for more of your Holy Spirit, that we would be able to fill up our lamp so that we burn brightly for Jesus without complacency, so that we're able, Lord God, to live on fire for you in a way that is passionate and, and, and purposeful as we use our gifts and abilities to see your kingdom come and your will being done on earth in the sphere that we move in. Lord God, we want to invest what we have in order to see more of your grace, your kingdom, your love extended in this place, in our area, in our world. And Lord, we pray that as we do that, that we would have an understanding of how best to help you as we help the poor. Lord God, put that in us, we pray, as we seek to live passionately in peaceful times. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.